happening, everybody? We're here, are here. We are here to record and talk more about horror movies because that's how we roll. It's time. It's October. It's fine. And I'm ready to go. Are you ready, Angel? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm ready, man. I am so happy to be here to talk more horror. There's nothing else I would want to do uh, right now than talk about these fantastic selection of films that you have for us i was literally up all night watching horror so i can't wait to just blurt it all out and talk about why these films are phenomenal and uh, essential to the genre you were shedding tears embracing your fears oh man <laughs> oh man it. i'm telling you i can't wait to get started on these movies me neither I, and i'm looking through my notes because i have a notebook here of different films. So you know what we're going to start with? We're going to start with a film that was, when announced, it was criticized, the idea of this film, oh, yeah. by me, by Daniel. Uh, I don't know if, it, if you were completely uh, like, oh, what? Why? But last year in 2019, we got a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and that movie is called Dr. Sleep, based on the book of the same name. It stars Ewan McGregor. It was directed by Mike Flanagan. And it is a movie about Danny Torrance in his adult years, dealing with you know, uh, more shining events. He meets this girl through the shining forces. He <sighs> basically takes her under his wing, protecting her from these cultists who want her energy her source so they can live forever and it's it's wild you know it's wild it, so i watched it in the theater i enjoyed it a lot it's a complete love letter to the shining film it was everything that i didn't i was worried and it w didn't meet any of my worried expectations it visually homage the shining so many times in ways that i don't think are cynical in ways that i think mean a lot to the film itself and the characters specifically of danny torrance they recreate events within the movie actually the movie opens up with the i, I believe a recreated scene uh, or a continued scene with those versions of the characters just with new actors and it's a pretty crazy film, and I really enjoy it because of that. I enjoy it because it's made by people who can't get enough of The Shining or the Kubrick method of filmmaking, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Now, I know that you were excited to watch this film, especially in preparation for this series that we're doing. So what did you feel about Dr. Sleep? I know you're a big Shining fan. But what was it about this movie that urged you to message me in the middle of the night saying, this is insane? <laughs> Julius, let me tell you about Dr. Sleep, man. I had watched this film for the very first time ever last night in preparation for this discussion. Within the first five minutes of the movie. I knew exactly what kind of film I was watching. Not only was it a love letter to the visual language of Stanley Kubrick to a mm -hmm. T, to a damn T, <laughs> but it also offered new ideas, new themes in this incredible enigma of a world that Stanley Kubrick and Stephen King have established. Dr. Sleep, and I'm not kidding you, is one of the best sequels to a film I've ever seen to what a oh. lot of people what to what I think a lot of people would consider to be the impossible making a sequel to the to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining sounds preposterous on paper <laughs> why they managed to do that man I'm telling you I think it's a flat out masterpiece flat out <laughs> masterpiece the movie was absolutely mesmerizing i cannot believe how good it was i really wished you watched it with me and my brother my brother shares the same sentiments as me dr sleep was ridiculous it should not have been that good it was incredible not just the visual language 
but the story as well, man. The story. It really did feel like a supernatural, superhero horror film. <laughs> and I need to see Mike Flanagan take on the X-Men in the MCU, man. Because this, <laughs> this movie was made for me. It was literally made for me as a lover of people who use their gifts for good as a lover of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, as a lover of the horror genre. This was another incredible love letter to the horror genre. I mean, I stood up when I saw Elm Street. I don't know if you caught that <laughs> reference, but there's literally the cameras panning down um, in that new town that Danny's living in. And you literally see Elm Street as one of the street signs that I'm like, yes, Mike Flanagan oh! gets this, man. He gets it. Um, but no, I, I was seriously blown away visually thematically um ewan mcgregor was phenomenal uh, the little girl who plays abra was a rock star in this film um rebecca ferguson as rose the hat oh my freaking god man i i literally was blown away seriously like i can dissect this movie every aspect about it i really loved um because when you watch it it makes you reevaluate Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, and it and it offers um, a new take on how to look at that movie, really. Yeah, completely um, new take. As not just like a horror movie, but as a supernatural thriller. Mm -hmm. Something that feels kind of like M. Night Shyamalan territory when it comes to like The Sixth Sense or Unbreakable. Um, it was really cool to watch, and I cannot believe Mike Flanagan really pulled it off, man. It it was fantastic. Because when you, when you break it down, Doctor Sleep is really about battling uh, addiction. And, yeah. and Danny trying to combat his addiction. And I mean, just the way that he used his gifts to comfort those who are dying in their last moments. I, I was literally like, I'm watching cinema right now. I'm literally watching cinema. It is so beautiful. And it was actually scary. When you see little Danny in those moments that take place after The Shining at their house and seeing the naked bathtub lady in his bathroom opening the door. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Yeah sinister and just awesome man awesome well something about this that we've brought up in another discussion where we talked about hereditary mm. um, we talked about how atmosphere was a very big part of that film how it really led you know the movie you know and the structure of it and how yes. it really paid off near the end and i think that's definitely the case with dr sleep you know emulating a lot of the tense moments and feelings from The Shining. Crazy. And it's insane how that's done visually and also through the characters' interactions. Yeah. Even new character interactions that are completely different from what we've seen before. You know, when uh, the Rebecca Ferguson character, she meets Danny and she has no idea who he is or what he's been through. Or the character stuff we saw in The Shining, she's completely ignorant of mm -hmm. who this guy really is and it gets you really excited for when they actually do meet and when they do head towards the overlook hotel uh, at the very end and i thought that that was a great part of it the cinematography is on point within this it just re basically recreating shots from the shining there's this one th there's this one shot that's really subtle where he's talking to someone in a, in a room i think it's like an interview uh, Ewan McGregor's character he's talking to someone and he's sitting down and it's shot in the same way that Nicholson was when he was interviewing for yep. uh, yeah. the uh, the what was his position at the over just the groundskeeper keeper. the groundskeeper yeah yeah it's shot yeah. the exact same way oh same exact way the yeah. set is made to look like in that layer in that same room even though yeah. they're not he's talking to Bruce Greenwood oh uh, that's right you yeah, know that's Batman right. from Batman Under the Red Hood <laughs> Uh, and by the way, Bruce Greenwood was fantastic, uh, even in his minimal role in this movie. Everybody, I'm telling you, th this movie shined like fire. I'm telling you, man, I, I couldn't believe it. I still can. I, I, I talked to my brother for hours about Dr. Sleep and how amazing it was. Seriously, like it, it, it really blew me away. I really did think it was, it was brilliant on all levels. Um, it should not have been that good. And, and yet it was, it, it. It was a it was an epic horror film mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. It was an epic horror film, man. 
I, I loved it so much. Seriously, the visual language of Kubrick, I'm, I'm referring to like the, the framing, the composition, um, you know, the using, lighting, the color. Yeah. Yeah. Using just these vast spaces um, and, and not being afraid to, to fill the frame with just, um, just fear the way that Mike Flanagan did. It really was crazy. It yeah. really was crazy. And I love the character development of Danny as well. Oh yeah. Uh, this, this is a very, um, it's heavily thematic movie. I think, uh, not only does it deal with alcoholism, it deals with loneliness. It deals with the idea of death. And I love the perspective that this movie offers that in death, we don't end. We actually, we go on. Mm -hmm. And that to me is such a beautiful outlook. Um, and, and just like, it's like a counter to, to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining because that movie is so cynical. It's so dark and twisted. This movie um, shines through the darkness. It, it really adds on to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining where it actually, for me, it enhances Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which is really crazy to think about. Yeah, I'm very happy that I was watching this movie and I eventually loved it when I was originally completely against it. I was like, "What? hell no. I don't want to see that shit. Yeah. I don't want to see that. You don't touch masterpieces like that. But <laughs> they touched it. And you got a great film with great characters, great actors, a great story that is pretty streamlined, especially compared to a lot of other Stephen King stories where they can get really wild. I've not read the book, so I don't know how accurate it is. I know that The Shining is not as accurate to the, the book as the movie you know all that the, there's that whole controversy back then mm -hmm. but i love that with stephen king's books since there are so many so many different films can come out and so many different qualities of films can come out you mm -hmm. know you get something like this and the mist and it and shawshank redemption so many different types of movies with so many different things to say you know and i love that this is probably my favorite you know, when it comes to Okay, well, I mean, The Shining exists, and so does Shawshank, but this is up there. You know what I mean? This is this is up there for me when it comes to it, King stories. Yeah, it's so up there. It's so up there. I I loved it. It had everything, man. It had horror. It had hope. It had um just the feeling of of it. It really did feel like a superhero movie. I'm telling you. Like it. <laughs> well, felt there's like that one shot where he's standing on the stairs with the the axe, and he's ready to get down. And yeah, I, when it's like, don't keep backing up. Swing that thing. So Just like lit, daddy. Man. It's so lit. And I really love the the switch on power dynamics there too. Because we're familiar with that place. We know Wendy was the one that originally was going up those stairs. And and Jack was like, yeah, come here. Give me the bat. And then we have a, a switch on power dynamics, which I think was so powerful with Rose the Hat going after Danny. Um, yeah. this, still this young, innocent boy who was struggling, who was struggling with his past, which is very traumatic. Um, every aspect about it. I oh, thought, and there's also really that scene was in perfection. The yeah, there's also that scene in the middle, which I thought was perfect, where it, they lay the trap for the cult, cultists, mm -hmm. uh, him and his friend, they yeah. lay the trap. And that's the moment where... His friend Abra, that was her name. No, no, no. I'm talking about the guy who oh, died. Oh, oh, oh. His friend who had... Who oh, was part Billy. Of the AA. Billy, I yeah. think Billy was his name. Um, Part of the AA, I, I believe. They were part mm -hmm. of AA together. Yeah. And they bonded this friendship and they laid a trap <laughs> for the cult members yeah. and when that scene happens i was in the theater i was like freaking out like yes oh my god like so good insane so good and i i love the billy character as well i thought he was significant to the story too because danny learned from him he learned that if you recognize somebody that is in pain if you recognize the look of somebody feeling lost do not hesitate to lend out a hand and help out mm-hmm um, because again, it's our gift that we can do that. We can communicate, we can listen, we can understand, you know, there's this one quote from, um, I think it's from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I think it goes like, if you can't look at the bright side, sit, then sit in the darkness with somebody, you know what I mean? And I, and I really love that because I felt like this movie was the epitome of that theme. I, it was freaking awesome. And I also love this idea that. The Overlook Hotel, them going back to it for the story, it didn't feel gimmicky. It didn't feel like, 
I'm just doing this because I know this is fan service. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's not how this movie operates. They literally take the idea of the Overlook Hotel and they merge it with the story in such a way that feels organic and fluid and natural and actually meaningful. Mm -hmm. That really blew me away. It really took my breath away. What did the Overlook Hotel represent in The Shining in the first movie? Well, it's kind of a puzzle. There's so many ways to look at it. But Mike Flanagan offers a very specific answer in this movie. It's a place that feeds on goodness. It's a place that feeds on individuals who are corrupted uh, within the soul or with addiction, which, which is why we get Jack Torrance in the first movie. But it's also a place that is a dark place and the world is a dark place and it feeds on things that are dark and also things that are good. For example, people who shine. So what are we going to do? Let's go back to that place because we know this is a really good chance for us to overcome our obstacle and take down the villain. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I love that. Here's Especially, John. <laughs> Especially when, you see how they take down the villain, the main character, oh and God. it's insane. Just that what I love about that sequence specifically, you're getting reintroduced into the hotel. It's not just mm -hmm. a set piece; it is a character. You know, yes, you're you're yes. being uh, you're being led through different hallways and different areas that were very significant within the first film, and there's a lot of history. And Ewan's performance, I think, is great because he acts upon that history you know he he's mm -hmm. like oh man that's where i almost got killed by my dad right there yeah. i saw that crazy thing over there down the yeah. hallway the two little the girls twins. were over there yeah the, twins, yeah the 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 door you know was broken into right mm -hmm. over there and i love that it takes that time to really build up like i said the atmosphere of that hotel oh yeah 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. and I, I, the movie doesn't work i think well, the thing is, I, I had already thought it was a masterpiece before we even got to the hotel. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, I screamed my head off. <laughs> me and my brother were looking at each other and we were like, don't you, don't you dare tell me they're going to play the music going up <laughs> to the damn mountain. And oh my God, Julius, I'm telling you, you know how I was during Avengers Endgame. You know how I was rewatching Lord of the Rings trilogy. Watching the Batman. When, when the music played for <laughs> when they were returning to the hotel, I actually lost my crap. Yeah, same here. Crap. And um, I, it was – imagine making something more epic and it happening, and that's what happened. That's exactly what happened, dude. Like I was screaming. I had goosebumps. I had literal goosebumps when they returned to that hotel. It was perfect. And I love that you mentioned that. They didn't treat it as a set piece. They treated it yeah. as a character. They treated it as a character. And that's exactly how Kubrick treated the Overlook Hotel in, in, in the first movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I felt like Kubrick would have thought about this movie the same way. A sequel? Hell no. Don't let it happen. But I really do feel if Kubrick saw this, I think he would have been impressed. I, I really do feel that way. This movie offers so much that it's just – it's gold. It is gold. He um, would have been like, there's no we in Kubrick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's an I. Exactly. And that's it. Exactly. It It was just such a phenomenal movie. I, I couldn't have been happier with it. Um, it's funny because when the whole idea of him closing up his ghosts in those boxes, I thought was really cool. And me and my brother at the end, at, like before the end even happened, we were like in the second act and we were thinking, this guy's probably going to release his ghost on Rose the Hat because she feeds on it, and so do they. And so we we kept thinking they take like, each other out. Yeah, we kept thinking like this this this. It reminded us of Ang Lee's Hulk when the Hulk was oh, like, "God, take it all," and we're like, "That's probably gonna happen." And of course, it did happen in such a fantastic way. What's funny is that the Ang Lee Hulk actually did come out of that box, and <laughs> you know, take it all, Hulk take give, it all. Hulk give, <laughs> Hulk shine. Yeah, dude. So that was awesome. And I also love um, <laughs> one li one line that I really loved was actually from Dick Holloran, who was um, one of Danny's friends from the first film who was killed by Jack Torrance in the chest. Yeah. Um, I really love when he said, you can you can trap those ghosts 
from the overlook in the hotel in those boxes. You can do that. But memories, you cannot. Those those stay with you forever. Um, I really love that line, and I really love Mike Flanagan's perspective on what a ghost is. Sometimes ghosts aren't like this supernatural force. Ghosts can be um, our trauma. Ghosts can be our memories. Ghosts can be um, grief in a way. I really like that perspective. I think that's a very interesting take on um, just this embodiment of fear. Yeah. That's really think, cool. I think that's awesome. And I think you and was just great as the older Danny Torrance, you know, uh, especially from where he starts out to what happens later with him. Mm -hmm. His, his event, just the, the high note that the movie ends on with his character was really nice. And it felt very sweet a bit. It felt odd, especially when you look at the shining, but mm -hmm. it felt natural at the same time. Like, Oh man, see people who go through trauma, they can eventually meet that you know comfortable and and i love that he ended it on his own terms you know of it was course. his choice to do so and i freaked out also when that music started playing i was like that's the only time you could have played the music yep yep when, like yep. if they played it earlier i would have been like a trash done yeah. this movie's over you know yeah. but yeah. they were smart about it they knew <laughs> what they were doing they knew exactly what the hell they were doing i'm telling you that was an epic that was an epic moment and it yeah. really did feel like an like it felt like an end game of horror, right? And, and they should have rare... sent Thanos into that hotel, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. it would have been done like that. And it's so rare that we get that. Um, but not not only was it just visually appealing, like really everything about it, like even those sequences where we have Abra, who was such a powerful shiner, when she's looking at Rose and her whole house flips on yeah. her and stuff like that. That oh to me man, was that was nuts. so insane. Rose meditating and and flying through the sky going through the clouds and um reaching out to abra so scary too that scene where her hand is trapped and she and rose tries to pull her hand out yeah. and her hand gets out all like deformed and stuff like that wonderful man literally a a, a horror fans like dream just it to did, see it dude like, it's true and it's something that we ask for where the the main character or the person who's being hunted just fights is like i've had enough of this shit yeah. get out of here you know it did for me when watching it i did remember feeling um okay this character this villain is less threatening now because i know that she's mm -hmm. gonna get whooped at some point so uh, at some point i was hoping that she would be like okay here's here's my 11th level of power you know <laughs> but you, you know but it didn't make it any less of a of a stakes filled ending mm -hmm. you know because he's swinging the axe kind of similar to how his mother was uh with the knife swinging, swinging the bat so or or the, knife, or the, yeah. no i think it was a bat actually yeah i think it was, what, a bat. It was a bat he she was swinging um really cool cool parallels there and i really love the uh, one thing that I found really interesting was how much I enjoyed the setup for the film, you know, where you're learning about where Danny is and what road he chose to take from this alcoholic yes. deadbeat yes. towards this guy who goes, you know, for, to help the community in his own way. Yes. Uh, really, really interesting setup that it made that ending more satisfying because yeah. you you weren't just wasting time you know mm -hmm. like so many other horror films do you just okay here are the teenagers they're dumb they're young uh we don't really need to give them too much development mm -hmm. uh which is probably why so much of the time when it comes to slasher films they're just a dumb teenager because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of character given to them at the very beginning yeah. whereas here there's a lot of development with Danny, he's contacting Abra through the wall, which I really love that detail. Oh my God, yeah. And uh, it just ended with a satisfying, I mean, axe, axe, yeah. axe, yeah. body spray. Yeah. It literally like, did. Yeah, everything you just said, yes, completely. I'm telling <laughs> you, I'm telling you, this is one of those movies where I can sit down and I can literally comment on every little thing that mm -hmm. I love, that I think is perfect, that I think, you know, works and makes it a masterpiece. The thing about his alcoholism, I really loved that scene where he talks about why he started drinking. And he said, my father, and this was eight years later when he cleaned up, 
which when that character development happens, it's like you couldn't be more happier for the guy because you know what he's going to do. He's going to use his gifts to help this little girl to, to, to prevent other kids from being brutally killed. He talks about his alcoholism and he says, you know, I'm holding a chip like my father did. My, my father had one of these. It, he had it for five months and, you know, then he got back into his horrible addiction. He broke my arm as a kid. You know, he almost killed our mom and stuff like that. Um, and he said, the reason why I drink is because this is the only way that I felt like I knew my dad. This is the only way that I can connect with him. And so that's why I drink and all that torment. When I drink, it goes away. It wipes away like a clean slate because our, our minds are like a chalkboard. Danny is at a position in his life where he has such a horrible outlook on life. He says the world is basically just a huge hospice with fresh air. You know what I mean? And it's like, wow, like he is so down in the dumps. Um, but there's a reason for it. They, they, they literally set up his character with a lot of complexity and taking everything that happened in Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and bringing it to fruition here. And I love seeing that. And at the end of his speech, he literally says, I know I drank to get to know my dad better, but I also know that my dad was here, standing here before. So everything that I experienced with my dad, all that trauma, I'm going to forgive him. And I'm here because I want to do this for my dad as well. Because really, I love my dad. And that to me was really powerful to me. The fact that he can experience all that horrible atrocity as a human being, as a kid, as a five-year-old kid. And be able to, as a man, reflect and be like, you know what? I'm going to do this for my dad so that everything that occurred between us and our relationship isn't in vain. Mm -hmm. That to me spoke to me a lot. It really spoke to me a lot um, in terms of us as human beings and how hope, no matter how, no matter what we go through, hope can always shine through. Always, 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 no matter what. Um, and I really love that because it led to the rest of his choices in the rest of the movie to, to be a hero, really to be a friend to Abra. It was kick-ass. <laughs> yeah, it was kick-ass. Kick-ass should have showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to see kick-ass in this movie. With his little batons going after. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up the movie question, it was something else, but I came up with a better one. I think, do you think that, if Stanley Kubrick were here and he saw Dr. Sleep, do you think he would like it? And do you think it would be a worthy enough successor to his film in his eyes? I really do. I really do. If, if, if he didn't like it, I would have to hear why. I really would have to hear why. And it has to be as in depth as we are, you know, just on the contrary. Um, what's not to like about this movie? I mean, other than, because I know Kubrick was very, in his films, he was blunt. He was cynical. He, he doesn't like to sugarcoat anything. And I don't know if I would consider Dr. Sleep a film that sugarcoats is shining. I definitely think it's the film that it, it, it turns a negative into a positive, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm not sure if that would have resonated well with Kubrick because he probably thinks of the world as like this really dark place and just thinks that it's it's filled with horrors um and there's not that much good you know i so that's why i feel like maybe he wouldn't it, it just wouldn't resonate with him on an emotional level right. but in terms but in terms of filmmaking in terms of the craft behind dr sleep I, I can't imagine him saying this isn't special because to me it was i mean to be able to recreate kubrick films um with similar visual language but with a modern flair to it. Uh, I don't understand how that's even possible yeah. yet. It, it occurred here. I could see it being a similar situation to with Dune, right? Dune mm -hmm. coming out with the Neven web directing it. Yes. And people ask David Lynch what he thinks about it. And they ask Jadarowski who was going to do Dune at one point. Mm -hmm. And they seem very disinterested you know, in the movie, like David Lynch specifically has said, I don't, I'm not interested in it because uh, the first film that he made that apparently was a really bad experience for him. So right. I could see that happening, you know, with this, you know, thing about uh, if Kubrick was around and he made even more movies, you know, who's to say he wouldn't have made Dr. Sleep himself. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. And wow, imagine what that would have been like. Yeah. Uh, insane. But 
I don't know how. I feel like there would probably be a distance between this movie and him. Uh, but I think that he would probably respect the film, the effort it took yeah, to recreate his style and his ambiance, which I think is a very important part of The Shining. You know, it's one yeah. of the more disturbing aspects of that movie is the feeling, you know, and mm -hmm. I think this captured it uh, e even before they get to the hotel. Yeah. You know? even way before. And that's what's crazy too. I love Mike Flanagan as a as a director. He is such a great and important voice for the horror genre. For those of you who haven't seen his other films, please check them out. I guarantee. What are they? List them you, out for the people. If, if you love Dr. Sleep, I guarantee, check out Hush, which I believe is available on Netflix. Fan-freaking-tastic and innovative. Um, check out Hush. Check out Oculus, which is another banger. <laughs> loved oculus it is great if you watch oculus if you watch oculus you'll understand why he was actually the chosen one to do a sequel to the shining you know it's funny about uh, a lot of what we mentioned like environment and atmosphere yeah. and uh you know being able to mess with the psychologically that is oculus and also last but not least check out his show um the haunting on hill house on netflix fantastic show i'm telling you Sorry, but, uh, but I had to say, it's funny that you brought up Oculus because I listened to a review from years ago from Double Toasted and they, they weren't fans of the movie, but one, they had a guest on who was like, who was like, oh man, I, you know, I'd say rent this. <laughs> and then they just went off on it. Like you don't, you piece of shit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I haven't no. seen Oculus. I know yeah. Karen uh, Gillian is in it. Yes. So I was like, oh. And so is the guy who plays um, Dick Grayson in uh, Titans. Yeah, um, okay, but Carrie and Gillian. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they're both wonderful. That's they're both girl. wonderful. And I guarantee you, like, the, the movie's great. The movie's great. I'm telling you. I'm going to send you that clip. Hey, actually, I'm going to incorporate it in this video. <laughs> Cut through it right now. <laughs> no, man, it, it's great. It really is great. You know? Okay. His, his entire work. His entire work. You can't make a movie like Doctor Sleep and not and not be a good filmmaker like and do no you think way. you should do x-men in the mcu I, yes 100 percent. yes those scenes where um it, just like you said like um danny taking her under his wing you know at first being reluctant my brother mm -hmm. was like wow he's very much like charles in days of future past which i completely see the similarities there um no but just the, just the overall theme of like having a gift embracing who you are very important to the X-Men and his set pieces in this movie, I think can be very exciting for uh, an X-Men movie. I mean, seeing Rose the Hat go through the sky like that, is that not Storm? Like, come on, bro. Like, is no, that no, no, that's Storm? not fair. Is okay. that, is that not Magneto dog? Like, come on. Like, yeah, he, he, is, that's some Jean Grey shit. He, he's my boy for, for the X-Men right now for MCU X-Men. How about this? We get him and we get Ewan McGregor's Xavier. Let's Up get it, that. boy. Let's get it, man. Let's. I, I'm. I'm so down. I'm so down. I'm telling you, I could not have been more impressed with this movie. It really is the ultimate love letter to The Shining, and yeah, it, it's literally like um, lightning striking twice. You know. Now That's that how you rare a movie like this is. Now that we're mentioning X Men directors, let's bring in Danny Boyle, huh? Let's bring in Danny Ooh! Boyle. <laughs> let's yes! do it. Let's Man, do it. Yes. Yes, and, and then cool. Xavier's Ewan McGregor can be like, mutants are shite! <laughs> <laughs> Along dude. with Scotland! Hell yeah, dude. Ewan McGregor's Mr. Sinister could work under Danny Boyle? 100%. 100%, <laughs> dude. I remember I wanted Ewan as uh, Mr. Fantastic. If that doesn't happen, I, I need him as Xavier. Hey, that could still happen, man. That could still it happen. It better happen. But it's yeah, not a stretch. Uh, my concluding thoughts on Doctor Sleep I, I I love the character development for sure. You know, Danny yes. Danny was um, somebody who was sick of tired of being sick and tired, like they said in the movie. And um, that's a great you know, line. <laughs> in in order in order for us to be, in order for us to come away, like I love when horror movies do this. Not only was it scary, right? Not only were there scenes where it's like, oh man, this is chilling. Like, oh hell no! Like, get away from that bathroom. Don't go with that naked you know, lady in the bathtub who's deteriorating and just like filled with mold and stuff like that. Well, at least not that one. Yeah. At least not that one. <laughs> but I love that really this movie 
really, when you think about it, it really is about trauma and, and how we can overcome that. And what's the best way that we can overcome it is if we face them, if we face our ghosts, that's exactly what Danny does. If we face our ghosts, if we face our, if, if we face our past, um, not just yourself, but together, if, if you face them with someone else, um, with someone holding your hand, with someone listening, with someone understanding, with someone willing to go the distance with you and, and experience that, sh that shared pain with you. Um, that's literally a solution, I think, to, to come away from trauma and, and turn something that is so vile into, into a, a literal light and to be able to change your perspective on, on your own pain. That, to me, is what I love about the movie a lot. That's beautiful, but it's not specific enough. You need telekinesis and you need to, <laughs> you need to trap them and force them, force feed them to ghosts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, when you really think about it too, it's, it, it really isn't so metaphorical. Well, it is metaphorical because I mean, what does Danny do? He locks up these, these ghosts, these demons, as we all have, we all have demons. He locks them up in the, in these boxes. Right. Mm -hmm. And when, when you really think about it too, it's, we shouldn't go about our way like that. We shouldn't have our demons, our troubles bottled up because what could happen is we can spiral downward and, and, you know, drink our problems away and, you know, and, and harm ourselves emotionally. What's important for us, for those of us who have demons in these boxes is to, is to unleash them once in a while um, in a very healthy way. Um, because when we unleash, when we unleash them, we experience catharsis. And catharsis yeah. is exactly, I think, the goal for people who uh, have psychological pain. Catharsis allows us to, to relieve ourselves um, in a productive way that uh, I, I just loved seeing that expressed through this movie. It, it, was so, it was so brilliant, I thought. And also, last thing before we end on Dr. Sleep is I really loved how they didn't use de-aging, but they used different actors to portray familiar characters like Wendy, like Dick, and, of course jack torrance what did you think about those scenes man i wish they put in uh the current jack nicholson in that suit. <laughs> that <would've> been... <laughs> just imagine his 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 him in that suit yeah. just like hey, you know things gotta go the way they gotta go danny boy <laughs> exactly <laughs> have a drink sir yeah. no i thought that was a really good scene and uh, I would have preferred if they didn't show him because it, mm. it just, it, it wasn't him, you know, it right, was right. not Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Uh, so it got a little bizarre, but I thought the actor did a really good job getting oh, yeah. that presence. of him. That's actually, that's, that actor is Elliot from ET. Wow. Yeah. As an older man, which that's is so, so crazy. Weird. Yeah. He's worked with Mike Lanigan before on hunting on Hill house. So they're really good friends. Um, but those scenes where they were recreating or they, they gave us characters who we're very familiar with, I thought the the actress who played Wendy was phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. I she thought so too. She definitely captured the essence of uh, Shelley Duvall as Wendy, along with the other characters like um, Dick and also um, Jack Torrance. Of course, it was jarring to see yeah. his face and it's like, oh yeah, that's not Jack Nicholson. But what I really appreciated about what Mike Flanagan did was he caught the essence of the character. Yeah. Um, I was able to, to, I didn't think of Jack Nicholson. I thought of Jack Torrance. Right. And I thought that scene was very intriguing as well, because really you saw Danny talking with his dad, but it's also him talking with his um, addiction. Uh, that whole scene is, is him and his addiction, you know, his, his addiction telling him, you know, just, just one drink. It won't cost a thing. I promise mm -hmm. on the house. And Danny's like, no, this 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 sip of of alcohol actually will cost me everything. It'll cost me eight years um, of my progress, and it also costed me my family. and And my mom can't even look at me. Um, when, when my mom died, she couldn't even look me in the eyes because of this 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 sip of drink. Because my dad traumatized her so bad. Um, so that was wonderful. Yeah. I love seeing them recreate the scenes, and also the scene at the very end when his mom holds him. And she basically tells him, son, I do love you. And what you are is a beautiful gift. And you are nothing like your father. You are so much more. We are bigger than what we think. Cinema. It's insane. Now let's move on to the next Cinema. movie because we have, to, <laughs> we have to do it, man. I could listen to you all day, but I won't. The <laughs>
The GOAT Podcast is proof you don't have to look any further for movie news, reviews, trailer reactions, or special discussions. Subscribe, get notified about what's going on, and I promise you'll be entertained by our daily content on YouTube. If you want more, we're on Twitter at GOAT Film Podcast, Instagram The GOAT Podcast, and The GOAT Movie Group on Facebook. Get connected with us, see what's happening, and make sure to love it while you're doing so.